Uh, good morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Allison Callett. I'm the Earth Science and Biology Editor over at Princeton University Press. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our one-day symposium, How Climate Works. Uh, it's co-sponsored by Princeton University Press and also the Princeton Environmental Institute. Uh, we have a great day scheduled, and I'm just going to take a moment to introduce Professor Jeff Ballas, who's going to be our Master of Ceremonies today, and we'll, of course, we'll also be giving our first talk. So, Jeffrey Ballas is a senior scientist and professor in the Program of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences here at Princeton. Uh, his research interests include the general circulation of the atmosphere and ocean and climate dynamics. He's taught a wide range of courses here at Princeton and has published over 100 scientific articles in leading journals. He's the author of two books, a leading graduate textbook, Atmospheric and Oceanic Fluid Dynamics, and also his primer, Climate in the Oceans, which was published by Princeton in 2011. Of course, he's going to be talking to us today about climate in the oceans. And please welcome Professor Vallis. Thanks, everybody. Is the microphone working OK? Sounds like it. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words about uh, today's events, and then I'm going to segue into my own talk. And um, so what, what we're here for today is to learn about how the climate works, a one-day symposium on the fundamentals of climate science for scholars, students, and the general public. <laughs> or just how the climate works. And, um, what it is, um, I think the motivation for this is that the communication of, of climate science has often fallen into two camps. Um, one is the professional research literature for scientists like the speakers that you have today. And the other is the somewhat occasionally sensational literature that you read about um, in some newspapers, not all newspapers. You see it in movies and so on. Um, but we felt there was a a sort of a gap in the middle. And the gap in the middle, I think, is what we're trying to fill. Um, the, um, so our hope is essentially to bridge that gap with a number of serious but not solemn books. Uh, and each book will have its own individual style, and I hope that you'll, uh, you'll look at some of them after today's talk. Um, we're often asked who is the audience for these books, and uh, I guess well, you are the audience. Um, but I think we have th three audiences in mind. Um, one is sort of the educated and motivated layperson. So the hope is that these books and the talks today could be understood by sort of anybody off the street who has an interest in science uh, and who has some education, but by no means do you need um, a science degree to understand the books. That is that, our hope. Um, another audience might be somebody, another scientist in another field, an astrophysicist or a historian who's looking for the big picture um, in our field. And perhaps the third audience would be undergraduate students or even graduate students, again, looking for, if you will, a quick read into the field. So um, each author is, I hope, um, an expert in his or own field, and they are here to talk to you today. Um, what about today's proceedings? Um, we're going to get talks of some, about half an hour, something like that, um, by each author, perhaps a little bit less. Um, questions are welcome, especially from the non-specialist. Um, what I would like to ask is that um, during the talk, at the end of the talk, you only ask questions of a clarifying nature. So even halfway through the talk, if you can't read a slide or something is completely opaque to you, then feel free to, uh, to ask a question at that time. But if you have some deeper philosophical issue uh, that you want to raise, uh, let's not raise that during the talk. We do have ample time for discussion um, during the course of the day. So you'll see that if you, if you look at the schedule. Um, so there are discussion periods. Uh, feel free also to buttonhole one of the speakers during the day at the coffee break or the lunch. Um, if you do want to buy one of the books, they're for sale out there. 
feel free to ask somebody to sign it if you want. Um, I'm sure everybody will be willing to do so. And at the end of the day, um, at about 5 o'clock, depending on how things go, there'll actually be a keynote speaker, uh, Andrew Revkin, uh, the well-known journalist from the New York Times. I've written a book which is called Climate and the Oceans. I'm, in, uh, I'm at Princeton University, so I'm a local here. And what I try to do in that book is to talk about how the ocean influences climate and how uh, climate itself impacts the ocean. Um, but why do we care, I guess, about the ocean? Um, apart from the fact that the shore is a nice place to visit. Um, we care about the oceans because um, the oceans are big, they're massive, uh, and they move. Um, unlike the land, which only moves on a very, very slow time scale. Uh, so in a sense, uh, because they move and vary, they are the pacemaker of climate. Climate variability on time scales of, of years to decades is governed by the ocean. And uh, the oceans are a low pass filter for climate. Um, what do I mean exactly by that? Well, in a little bit more detail, the oceans transport heat from the equator to the pole. Uh, just like the atmosphere does, uh, the oceans transport, as a ballpark figure, about a third of the heat which goes from the equator to the pole goes through the oceans, and about two thirds go through the atmosphere. Um, so the oceans warm the poles, and they cool the equator. Um, if we didn't have the oceans, the poles would be quite a lot cooler, and it has been suggested that um, they'd be so much cooler that the sea ice would extend. Uh, as sea ice extends, it reflects more solar radiation back to space, so the whole planet cools. And some people have actually suggested if the ocean were not there, the ice sheets would expand all the way down to the subtropics. So essentially we'd get something like um, what is sometimes called a snowball earth, that the earth is covered in ice and, ice and snow. Um, so they're pretty important. The variability of the ocean um, is also extremely important. Um, it's the main source of the variability of the climate on interannual to decadal and longer timescales. If the oceans didn't vary, of course, we'd still have weather. Um, but one year would be more like the next year than it is now. It's because of slower variations in the ocean that years differ from each other mainly and that decades differ from each other a lot. Um, Many of you will have read that the first decade of this century, the years from about 1998 to 2010, there was hardly any global warming at all. Um, some people have even suggested global warming has stopped. But in fact, most likely, that lack of warming has been because of internal variability of the ocean. Um, although I should say that's also a research question. We don't definitively know the answer to that. Um, just as a aside, as an aside, there's lots of things we don't know in science. Um, and we as scientists are, or should be, skeptical. In the global warming business, the word skeptic has been hijacked, unfortunately, by people who I wouldn't call skeptics. I'd rather call them deniers and contrarians. Uh, I'd like to think of all of us as skeptics, um, and we should be skeptics. That's the nature of science, and we should be arguing with, with each other, um, but not denying the facts. So uh, I'm kind of proud to be a skeptic, but, uh, but, not, a, but not a denier. Um, what else do the oceans do? They provide storage of heat and of carbon dioxide, and I suspect you may hear, hear a little bit more about that in my talk. Um, later on, and perhaps also from David Archer and Dave Schimmel, uh, perhaps. Um, and perhaps of most interest to many people is that the oceans slow the pace of global warming. We'll talk about that a little bit more, too. If 
if we didn't have the oceans, but we just had, let's say, a swamp, so there were lots of water, most likely the climate would already be quite a lot warmer than it is now. Um, so, a little bit more, a little bit more detail. Um, what do the oceans do? They take up heat. Um, so, as we add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, the atmosphere warms. Um, it's already warmed by about a degree or so. Um, but it doesn't warm as quickly as it could be because the oceans are absorbing quite a lot of that heat. If we were to stop adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere right now, if somehow all the political stars aligned uh, and emissions um, went down to such a degree that the carbon dioxide level stayed the same, temperature would actually keep on increasing for the next several hundred years. Uh, as heat slowly is absorbed into the ocean. Um, of course, we don't know, it's a scientific question, exactly how heat is communicated to the deep ocean, how efficiently that occurs. These are all research questions, but we do know that the ocean is slowing the rate of global warming. Um, and of course, the oceans also transfer heat um, in the great ocean gyres and by the deep overturning circulation. Um, and these current systems vary uh, on timescales of years to decades and perhaps even centuries. So let me show a, um, just a, a down-to-earth figure about what heat storage does in the ocean. Um, it ameliorates the extremes of heat and cool. It does that on a daily basis and it does that on an annual basis. Um, so here are two Uh, two graphs. Uh, this is San Francisco. This is New York. This axis is temperature. This is the yearly cycle. Um, two curves are the, are the high temperature and the low temperature for the day. What are the units for temperature? Degrees Celsius, which is uh, a little bit... Uh, one degree Celsius is just a little bit less than two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but degrees Celsius, we tend to, um, we, we prefer to. 68 Fahrenheit. 68 Fahrenheit, okay. 20 is 60. 20 is, okay. Um, so look at what is happening to San Francisco. Uh, you know, uh, the annual cycle in San Francisco hardly exists at all. It's very weak. And one is reminded of that phrase of, uh, of Mark Twain, the coldest winter he ever spent was summer in San Francisco. And uh, certainly summer. In fact, uh, so the annual cycle is less than, oh, it's, it's not much more than five degrees Celsius, so about 10 degrees Fahrenheit from the coldest depths of winter to the heat of summer in San Francisco is about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, not only that, the, the peak, the highest temperature uh, in San Francisco is late in the season. September is the warmest month. Compare that to New York, uh, which has a much more continental climate. New York is also, of course, on the, on the coast, just like San Francisco, but it's on the east coast. The weather comes from the west, uh, by and large. So effectively, New York has a continental climate, where San Francisco has a maritime climate. Uh, New York, the annual cycle goes from about uh, 5 degrees Celsius to almost 30 degrees Celsius. So an annual cycle of about 25 degrees Celsius, almost 50 degrees, a little bit less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, that's why some people like New York's climate and some people don't, I guess. I actually kind of prefer San Francisco's climate, but New York's a great city, so... It's all, a, uh, it's all swings and roundabouts, I guess, in, in, in where you choose to live. Um, not only that, the annu uh, well, here's, a, here's another depiction of, uh, of something rather similar. This is the annual cycle of temperatures in the two hemispheres. Uh, this is latitude. 
This is the temperature in degrees Celsius. This is the annual cycle, how big the difference is between summer and winter. And you see that the solid line is the northern hemisphere, the dashed line is the southern hemisphere. So the annual cycle over large swaths of the middle latitude northern hemisphere is 10 to 15 degrees Celsius, or about 20, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. The annual cycle is much less in the southern hemisphere, and that's largely because the southern hemisphere is full of water. Uh, there's much less land mass in the southern hemisphere than, the, than in the northern hemisphere. Not only that, the lag is, is greater. This is the lag, um, again, as a function of latitude. The lag meaning the time between the maximum of the solar input and the time of maximum temperature. So maximum solar insulation tends to occur in late June. Uh, but the maximum temperature will occur sometime after that, in July or August or whenever. But um, in the Southern Hemisphere, the lag occurs 40 to 50 days after um, the midsummer maximum, whereas in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's more like 30 days. So uh, as a rough rule of thumb, in the Northern Hemisphere, your hottest time is in late July. In the Southern Hemisphere, your hottest time is in late August. And that's, again, because the oceans of... Um, Uh, you're right. Yes, right. Uh, uh, late February. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so uh, what about climate variability? Um, here's perhaps the, the largest uh, or the most well-known example of climate variability, and it's called El Nino. El Nino is, um, means the baby. Um, the Christ child, it's because it's an event which um, has its maximum around the time of Christmas. Um, what I'm showing are three, curve, are three plots here. The top plot is a sea surface temperature in a quote-unquote normal year, uh, in particular in December 1996, and it's this is South America, over here is Australia. In the normal years, you get cold water upwelling here so there's this cold water tongue uh, coming out off of South America. Uh, and all the hot water is over here in the Western Pacific off of Indonesia. Every so often, that pattern almost reverses. Uh, and this is the sea surface temperature in an El Nino year. And in an El Nino year, this upwelling disappears. You get warm water spreading almost all across the equatorial Pacific. Um, and this is the difference between the sea surface temperature in an El Nino year uh, and a non-El Nino year. And so the difference is most marked here in the Eastern Pacific. Um, I'll show you a time series. And El Nino is now is understood now to be a couple phenomena involving both the um, ocean and the atmosphere. It's often referred to as ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, but it is a time series going from 1870 to 2000 uh, of essentially the sea surface temperature uh, over a region of the Eastern Pacific. And uh, all of these, the biggest peaks of El Nino's, or El Nino events, I should say, uh, Two of the biggest ones, and I remember them both because uh, I was in California at the time, the 82, 83 El Nino, and one in the late 1990s, which have probably been the biggest two El, El Nino events, uh, certainly in the last century. Uh, and they caused a great deal of damage, um, including a landslide in my backyard in 1997. Uh, but... Uh, Heavy rain in California, especially 83, 98. Flooding and landslides were common. Very large, hundreds of millions of dollars of financial damage uh, and human losses. Uh, 
Interestingly enough, during El Nino years, rainfall is suppressed in northern Australia uh, and in Indonesia because normally you get a lot of convective rainfall in those regions uh, because the sea surface is warm. In El Nino years, the sea surface is cool in the Western Pacific, so it suppresses rainfall in North Australia and Indonesia. We tend to get higher global temperatures in El Nino years. Um, turns out El Ninos, for reasons I won't go into, suppress hurricanes, so a, a benefit, if you will, uh, of an El Nino event is you're less likely to have strong hurricanes in the Atlantic in that year. Uh, but storms over the Atlantic tend to move southwards, and that certainly affects European weather. And uh, if you're into wine, um, it is said that, but I can't remember whether El Nino years are good years or bad years for wine, but it's one or the other. Um, so let's talk then a little bit about global warming. And... Um, Global warming is the name we use to identify the increase of temperatures over the past 100 or so years and the expected increase of those temperatures. Um, it's, and this is the temperature anomaly, temperature in degrees Celsius uh, over the past 120 or so years. And temperature has gone up by a little bit less than a degree Celsius. Um, uh, about a degree and a half Fahrenheit. And uh, the black curve is, is an average five-year running mean. Uh, the blue curve is the year-to-year uh, -year temperatures. Global warming, of course, to try and encapsulate um, global warming just by using a single temperature, of course, misses an awful lot about what is happening with global warming. It misses all the regional effects. Nonetheless, it's useful to talk about the increase in global temperatures because uh, other regional events, other regional um, consequences of global warming will scale with the amplitude of global warming. So it's a useful, a useful single measure. Um, this is, so this is the increase which we nearly all believe is due to the increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, mainly carbon dioxide. It's kind of interesting... Um, that over the period from about 1945 to 1975, temperatures hardly went up at all. Um, that was most likely due to a combination of natural variability, uh, again caused by variations in the ocean, uh, and also the fact that a lot of aerosols were put into the atmosphere over that period, um, both from anthropogenic pollution and from volcanic activity. Uh, causing this temperature to stay flat. And then it shot up fairly rapidly in the last part of the century. And it's been a little bit flat again in the last 10 years. Um, to put that in context, um, with a little bit more uncertainty, here is the temperature increase, or the temperature record over the past 1,000 years. Uh, of course, only up here, in the last uh, 100 or so years have we had instrumental records. So the past record back here is due to proxies, in particular tree rings, coal records, and so on. So there's a lot more uncertainty about what the temperature was uh, 800 years ago uh, than what it was 80 years ago. And this gray banding here represents a measure of the uncertainty. Uh, Pardon? So this is the this is the temperature. Northern hem this is actually the northern hemisphere. Uh, this zero line is the it's all relative to the mean from 1961 uh, to 1990, and this is time going along this axis. And this figure is called, for obvious reasons, has been called the hockey stick, and it's. Uh, um, for a time, it was a little bit controversial, but by and large, in broad brush, uh, we believe that this is, uh, this is how it is. Uh, it's slightly warmer back here. This is sometimes called the medieval warm period. It's somewhat cooler here. It's 
sometimes called the Little Ice Age. But this rapid increase in temperatures over the past 100 years is somewhat unprecedented. And we believe this, by and large, do uh, to the increase in carbon dioxide over the past. Uh, well, this is an actual instrumental record of it, um, done by um, David Keeling, who measured carbon dioxide with an instrument uh, at the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Uh, and this is his record. Uh, and it's from the late 1950s to the present, it's gone up from about 310 parts per million to 390 parts per million. In a two or three years' time, it will probably exceed 400 parts per million. And it will just keep on increasing. Um, nearly all that carbon dioxide has come from anthropogenic burning of fossil fuels, from oil uh, and coal. And that's, that's rather incontroversial. This little uh, annual cycle here is sometimes called the earth breathing. It's the respiration. Um, every year, plants will take in carbon dioxide, release oxygen. There's a seasonal cycle associated with that because the northern hemisphere has more land than the southern hemisphere. So let's accept, as we, near, as we all do, um, that this increase in carbon dioxide is causing the global warming. It would have to be, there would have to be something extraordinarily weird about the climate system for that increase in carbon dioxide not to cause global warming. Um, it would have to, the climate would have to behave in a very strange way indeed. So what's the ocean doing uh, about global warming? Uh, well, there's sort of good news and bad news. Uh, so... What is the good news? Um, the good news is that the ocean is, will slow down the development of global warming. Um, if we didn't have the oceans, as I mentioned, if it were, the ocean were just a swamp, if there was still a source of water but no heat capacity, most likely uh, global temperatures would be at least a degree or so higher or, uh, than they are now. Uh, so without the ocean, the global temperature responds almost immediately to greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide. Um, so if what I'm calling the equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is the ultimate response to a doubling of carbon dioxide, that's, we estimate that to be somewhere in the neighborhood of four degrees Celsius. Then without the oceans, we'd achieve that temperature just a few years after the greenhouse gas increase. Temperature would increase quite rapidly. Um, with the ocean, it's going to take several centuries to reach that level. So that's kind of the good news. Um, we, have a little bit of, we have a little bit of time, if you will, uh, to confront the full magnitude of the problem. Uh, what's the bad news? Uh, the bad news is that the level of global warming is maintained even after we've stopped emitting greenhouse gases. Um, so if we were to magically stop emitting greenhouse gases now, uh, the temperature would not fall back to its level, to its pre-industrial level. It will stay there for centuries because it will take a long time uh, for the ocean to reabsorb or any other components of the Earth's uh, climate system to absorb that carbon dioxide. So it will take centuries and centuries for the level of carbon dioxide to fall once emissions cease. So the temperature will stay high for a very long time. Uh, so it's a long-term problem. Um, so furthermore, uh, burning all of our oil and coal reserves will actually not just double carbon dioxide. We often talk about what will happen when we double carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. If we um, exercise our ingenuity, which unfortunately or fortunately the human race is wont to do, and we extract all the coal and all the um, heavy oil and burn all the fossil fuels, most likely um, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere will go up much more than a factor of two, perhaps more like a factor of six. Um, 
And it's going to stay warm then for many years, centuries, most likely. And a sustained level of warming uh, at that level could bring truly catastrophic consequences. Uh, if the atmosphere warms, even by as, on average by as little as 2 degrees Celsius, it will probably warm more than that at high latitudes. Um, so if it could then warm by 4 degrees Celsius over Greenland, stay that way for centuries, causing the, uh, likely causing the Greenland ice sheet to melt. Um, here's just a graph showing that the ocean is itself warming. Um, it's often proposed that the uh, cause of global warming is not greenhouse gases, it's somehow the ocean emitting heat into the atmosphere. If that were the case, then that would be accompanied by cooling in the ocean, not by warming. But in fact, just look at the top, temp top graph, for example. That's the total ocean heat content over the past 50 years. So the ocean has actually been warming. So the ocean is warming because of global warming. Um, and um, the ocean is not causing global warming. Um, here just a, a research example that we're doing now. Just to, uh, It's my last slide before I will conclude. Um, it's just an experiment. So this is now the forefront of research. This is not even, uh, we haven't actually even published this. Um, but this is an experiment that we did with a state-of-the-art uh, climate model um, showing what might happen if carbon dioxide emissions did this. Here's the time axis. Let's suppose we're emitting carbon dioxide. Then in the year uh, 2100, we stop emitting completely, uh, so there are no additional carbon dioxide emissions. What happens to the carbon dioxide level? It goes up uh, as we emit, and then it very slowly diminishes. Uh, but it takes hundreds and hundreds of years to get back uh, to its pre-industrial level. In that time, what happens to temperature? Temperature goes up fairly rapidly as we're emitting carbon dioxide, and then it more or less stays constant. It doesn't, temperature doesn't fall once we stop uh, emitting carbon dioxide. So let me, um, let me skip to my last couple of slides. Um, just to summarize, what do we know? Without the oceans, the climate would be more extreme in almost all aspects. The equator would be warmer. Um, uh, the poles would be colder. Um, even if water were abundant, the planet would be inhospitable and perhaps uninhabitable. The, the oceans give climate much of its variability, and the oceans slow down global warming, but at the same time, global warming will persist for centuries. Um, so if I were to perhaps end on a slightly personal... So this is now just a personal viewpoint, not a... Uh, accepted viewpoint by the scientific community. Um, but in part because of the ocean, in the short term, global warming may, may be a smaller problem than sometimes perceived. Uh, but in the long term, global warming will be a larger problem uh, because of its inevitability and because global warming isn't going to go away. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you for uh, listening. <laughs>